Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. On today's show, we're going to talk about sex. So if your kids are listening, this would be a good time to pause the podcast. Okay, great. Um, Now that you're back, I want to bring us back to a, a way of talking about sex that we haven't mentioned in a while on the show, but it's so important, I think, to a relearning of how we even experience our sexuality and our sensuality, because so much of the way that we do sex with our partners is the product of just happenstance. It's like who we happen to be with when we come alive as a sexual being. For some of us, it's not a very positive experience at all. Actually, that's probably true for many of us. And then we such begins this accumulation of experience that in the end leaves us in this place that we probably never would have intended. If someone had said, hey, do you want to learn about this fascinating thing called sex that makes you feel amazing or at least has that potential to do that and also helps you connect on the deepest level with your partner, you would probably never design a a way of educating yourself about sex that resembles how it happens in real life. So we've talked a little bit in the past about new ways of approaching our sexuality. Way back in episode two with Diana Richardson, who wrote The Heart of Tantric Sex. And we, we talked about her version of slow sex, which is this, this way of making love that's not about orgasm. It's about cultivating the sensation and the experience that you have with your partner. We also talked about um, why orgasms and And in this case, what I mean are peak orgasms uh, are bad for your relationship. Now, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's an important topic that we discussed with Marnia Robinson, who wrote Cupid's Poison Arrow back in episode five. That's just a couple of the, the episodes that we've had to talk about sexuality that I think are pretty important. And this one is going to add to the conversation where we explore what Chloe and I call the difference between O1 and O2. O1 is that, that peak orgasm that we're used to having and which in some respects might actually be detrimental to your relationship. And O2, this vast, uncharted, orgasmic territory that you discover when you get off of the agenda of like coming and and having that peak climax and actually open yourself up to the experience before and leading up to and maybe not even including that peak. Maybe you explore the that territory that before was just a means to an end and now it can become an end unto itself and the more you do it the the broader that becomes okay enough from me today's episode features aubrey fuller who is the co-owner of one taste in new york and los angeles and she is the director of promotion and marketing for the entire one taste organization and we're going to talk about orgasmic meditation or oming you can find out more about oming on the one taste website you can also read the book slow sex by nicole de doan who is not able to be here on the show with us but we wanted to get someone on the show to talk about orgasmic meditation because it's such a valuable way to rediscover how you connect sexually sensually orgasmically with your partner so We're going to cover a lot in this episode. As always, if you're interested in the show guide, the detailed show guide, you can download it at neilsatin.com slash ohm, and that's O-M, or you can text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions, and we'll get a link to you so you can download the show guide. All right, that's it. On with the show. Aubrey Fuller, thank you so much for joining us today here on Relationship Alive. Hi, thanks for having me. It's awesome to be here. Great. Um, I'm wondering if you could just take a moment and tell us about, in a nutshell, what is orgasmic meditation? When you When you hear those words put together, 
it it sounds confusing because you think of orgasm as something you know that you do that's very like active maybe and meditation is this like really quiet thing that you know where you have to be alone with a candle burning or something like that so what <laughs> what is like in a, and and we're going to go deep into how you actually do orgasmic meditation so you don't have to give the whole you know process right here but can you sum up and wet our appetite about what is orgasmic meditation and, and why is it so valuable yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, orgasmic meditation or OM, OM, OM for short, is a 15 minute partnered practice. Um, there's a stroker and a strokey. The strokey has a clitoris, um, and the stroker will stroke um, the strokey's clitoris for 15 minutes in a goalless fashion. Um, and I'll definitely go into that more. Um, but it's a very specific kind of stroke. It's the only activity that happens uh, throughout that 15 minutes. There's a timer. Um, there's a specific way to set up the nest is what it's called in which the practice is done. Um, there's like, you know, specific things that go with it that make up what's called a container. And it's only in that 15 minutes. Um, it's like a very simplified access point to um, a lot of intense connection between two people. And it could be done with a partner. It could be done with a friend. Basically, someone that you know, like, and trust. Got it. So you probably wouldn't just walk down the street and ask a random person if they'd like to own with you. I, in general, no. I do know people who um, are that, like... Uh, like to push edges in their life that much. And no, like most people, you know, it's like we definitely recommend you ask somebody that you know, like, and trust because it is a vulnerable experience. Yeah. And just to be clear, at One Taste, which, as I mentioned earlier, exists in New York and Los Angeles and in a few other cities throughout the world, you can actually go in and practice this with someone who is trained in how to be a stroker. Is that right? Not exactly. Um, there's a communities of people all over the world. There's five major cities where there's large communities and like, you know, classes and things like that, that take place in those cities. And then there's a lot of smaller ones as well. Um, we definitely, it's not like you can come in and, you know, own with a teacher or something like that. Like it's, it's, it's more like you can come in and you can meet people in the community and you can ask somebody else who owns to own. And that person may or may not have a lot of experience. You know, it's totally, it's totally up to you. Like each person gets to, to decide how they want their practice to be and who they want to own with and who they want to ask and all that. Got it. Well, that, that already seems better on some level to me. <laughs> I don't know why <laughs> there's something a little odd about about that idea of going into a center and just being like, yes, yeah, so I'll take the I'll take the 15 minute <laughs> ohm for how much would that be anyway? With uh, so and so for who's had 5 years of experience. Thank you. No, 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 no. <laughs> we cuz it's it's like it's really important um with something like this that people have full um like full volition, full, full decision. made. It's like they really, you really get to each person really gets to decide how they want their practice to be and who they want it to be with. Um, you know, it's sort of like we tell you the who, or we tell you the how, what, where, and you know, of orgasm, but we leave the who part to you. <laughs> <laughs> we leave the who to you. Um, <laughs> and, and give me a little more info on why, why would someone want to do this? Um, honestly, like the, the benefits are so extensive. It's kind of funny. Like every time somebody asks me some question like this, I always am just like, Oh boy. Um, I always want to give some sort of specific answer that, that lets people have a bite of what it offers. And the truth is the, the benefits just go so far past what anybody expects to get from it. Um, speaking from my own experience, like when I came in and started doing the practice about eight years ago, I uh, was expecting, you know, I would come to one taste events and meet really shiny people who just seemed really like generally turned on, not, not even necessarily turned on in a sexual way, but just turned on and happy and shiny and bright and very connectable. And I just thought, what are you people doing to have it be that you feel like this all the time? And 
So eventually, you know, I decided to try the practice because of how people who were doing the practice showed up. And I just wanted that. Like, I just wanted to feel that kind of alive. And mm. and I would say that one of the first things that happened for me was an in- incredibly increased amount of confidence. Like, I came in very shy and um, very socially awkward and really kind of terrified of people in a lot of ways. Like, I grew up an only child and I've just I just had... Been, I had had a lot of isolation in my life in a lot of different ways. And so I wasn't that great with people or around people. And I started within a few months, I felt so much more confident, you know, and that wasn't something that I was necessarily expecting from it. You know, another thing I wasn't expecting from it is like um, a really deeply improved relationship with my family. You know, like how hmm. would it end up doing that? You know, like it's just not something that you think of when you're first trying something like this out, but it's definitely a huge, uh, been a huge part in like why my relationship to my family feels so much better now than it used to, you know? And, and so there's a lot of different things like that. Um, just to mention, just to mention a couple. Yeah, one thing that really stuck with me as I was reading Nicole Daydon's book, Slow Sex, was the healing potential of really getting to know this side of your own experience. And so many people have been, you know, whether it's shut off from their sexuality or had to keep it hidden or suppress it, that, that it, it could create this like disconnecting force where even though it's like at the core of, you know, what makes us alive, or at least it's one of the things at the core of what makes us alive, um, it can be something that we feel so disconnected from. So I was just struck by how this exploration of sensation and connection and, and even like the, uh, like getting comfortable with that part of your body as a woman, how that could have this, I could see it having this pervasive impact on, on everything in your life. Um, as you reconnect with that part of yourself and explore it in a way that's, that's way, um, more nuanced and, and rich than how you might have experienced it in typical sex. That's, that's really, really well put. Yeah, that is exactly right. You know, it's, it's such a foundational, fundamental part of, um, really all, all genders, you know, relationship to body and sexuality and everything, feeling, sensation, all of that connection. It's such a fundamental piece of the puzzle, um, that when you, you know, what I've seen with people and for myself over the years, like when you start oming, um, something, yeah, something starts to really heal in a deep, deep way and wake up. And, um, and yeah, as a, as a woman, like I'll say, I, I was talking to somebody about this the other day and I realized that there's just a certain feeling as a woman and I, I won't speak for all women ever, but I've talked to enough to know that it's definitely, um, a fairly like pervasive experience for women is that you just kind of feel like you were born a little bit wrong like there's just something in a lot of cultures, it's like slightly shameful to be, it's, it's shameful. Like menstruation is shameful in to many people, you know, it, it's like gross and all these things. It's just like, you just feel kind of a little bit to a lot wrong being yeah. a woman. <laughs> yeah. And so if you're, you know, you're, you're having this oming experience and, and maybe like once a day or a few times a week or even a couple times a day, you're, you're being, stroked in this exquisite attention kind of way for 15 minutes, it has a huge, you know, like something in you just, um, it, uh, opens and relaxes and releases. And you're just like, maybe I'm not wrong. You know, like maybe it's not bad to have genitals and shameful and maybe like it's, it's safe too, you know, like maybe it's actually safe to be like female in the world. You know, there's some deep kind of primal place that just feels like it sort of kind of opens up a little bit and, and allows, um, a different perspective to begin to form. Yeah. There are, so there are two questions that come up for me right now. Um, and they're very different, but I'll, I'll do the, this one first, since I think it's a simpler and shorter answer. Um, is it, 
is this primarily something that's performed on a woman? Can it also be performed on someone who has a penis? The strokey always, like for simplicity's sake in this conversation for sure like the strokey always um needs to have a clitoris it's like it's an exploration of orgasm but specifically feminine orgasm not necessarily female orgasm but feminine style orgasm like um ma- like a masculine style orgasm is it's a it's it's a ascent a climb towards something And then there's a burst or like an explosion at the top of ejaculation or climax or whatever, you know, like party time, like woo at the top. (laughs) And then (laughs) it comes down, you know, and then, and then stops. And that's, that's masculine orgasm, not necessarily male orgasm, because that's not even all how all men experience orgasm, but it's, it's, it's the masculine style of orgasm. And it's awesome. I'm not even saying anything negative about that. I think it's great. And, um, Women's men's bodies do tend to have an easier time with it, although not always. And women's bodies tend to have a harder time with it, although not always. And so feminine orgasm is like um, more – it's much more nonlinear. It may or may not include climax. It It's more like there's not so much of a beginning and not so much of an end. It's just more the middle part. You know, it could go up and then down and then left and then right and then down again. And like you follow it with your attention and it's not necessarily, uh, you don't really know what it wants to be or where it wants to go. And so it takes attention to follow it. And it's like, um, you know, if you've ever had like a, a sexual experience where you just go so deeply into it, you forget about any kind of agenda whatsoever. You have no idea how much time has gone by and you're just in it. You know, that's like kind of feminine style orgasm. And we actually, the masculine and feminine terms were something we used more often, um, <laughs> earlier on in one taste. And we've been kind of changing that from masculine, feminine to orgasm 1.0 and 2.0. Yeah. Um, in order to make it, you know, to have it feel more accessible to all genders. Um, but you know, because of the question about anatomy that you started this piece with, I, I, I'm using those, those terms instead. Um, and so the, the strokey does have to have a clitoris and, um, and, uh, I had a teacher once who said, basically, as far as like, Oming, if you have a, if he, he was like, if you have a clit, get it stroked. If you don't have a clit, stroke one. And it was basically that simple. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, okay, great. Yeah, I was thinking a little bit about the the appendix in Nicole's book that talks about how to how it could be done on a man, and at the same time, it sounds like maybe it's evolved to a point where that seems less important for some reason. It's like, um, like there have been times, um, when like we've, we've had classes in the past that discuss like male ohms, which is what you'd be talking about. And, Mm -hmm. um, and so it is a thing and it's like oddly considered a very advanced practice, um, for, reasons to do with gender and like how men and women tend to come into the practice. Um, like oftentimes men tend to come in. I just like, I hate making generalizations and I hate like hammering it down into binary gender, but it feels like (laughs) just to answer the question clearly, I have to do that for a moment. Um, so men tend to come into the practice having, um, a pretty good like generally a pretty good direct contact kind of relationship with their genitals and maybe not as great of a relationship to empathetic, uh, get off. Mm. So direct get off, nailing it, right. Totally nailing it. Indirect empathetic get off, missing that nutrient a bit, which is why men tend to turn towards porn in lieu of connection, uh, because it's empathetic get off. And so, um, uh, and then women tend to come in uh, having not had very um, skillful direct touch to the most sensitive spot on the human body, the clitoris, uh, 
and not, and they don't actually like a lot of times people don't have a lot of knowledge around that spot. They don't actually know how to fully access it. They don't know about gently pulling the hood back. They don't know about the one o'clock spot. They don't know. It's like men and women tend to not know, um, about this mysterious location as much, nearly as much as there is to know. And so it kind of feels like women are, you know, it's like if a woman is in, in a sexual experience and she's kind of like moving her hips around a lot and kind of like grinding in this way and sort of like, you're trying to get that spot touched and you don't know how to ask for, it's like, you don't know what to say to somebody to get it touched. Cause you're not even exactly sure what it is, but that's what women are going for when they're doing that. Hmm. Um, and so they tend to come in, uh, having, you know, like women will be like, I can come from someone else coming, you know, like that's how much empathetic get off women have access to in general. Mm. They're like, if my partner comes, I will come like, that's how much empathy that they're naturally, they naturally have, but their direct get off is lacking. And so having it be that, um, it's arranged where it's, uh, women getting stroked. It, then it's like, she gets the direct and then if her partner is male, he gets the empathetic and they, so they both get to, Oh, Oh, Oh. And then women turn to vibrators in lieu of connection, which is just straight up super direct, intense stimulation. Right. So it's like porn for the men, vibrators for the women. So oming addresses the missing nutrient in both cases. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It makes yeah. total sense. Um, and I just wanted to point out that as I was uh, mentioning in the introduction, we've talked on the podcast a little bit of, and we call it O1 and O2 and O1 being like that climax kind of orgasm where once it happens, there's this huge decline in turn on and often either partner might be too sensitive to even like go any further at that point. Um, mm -hmm. And um, when we had we had Marnia Robinson on the show, um, who wrote Cupid's Poison, Cupid's Poisoned Arrow, which is all about how having climactic orgasms is actually bad for your relationship. And I'm you know I'm making a sweeping generalization here, but the the science behind it being that it fosters um, habituation. So you're like you're kind of on this dopamine driven cycle of. Um, where you're actually going to get acclimated to your partner and ultimately want to seek novelty somewhere else um, in order to stay turned on. And she points out all of the, the biological reasons why that might be so. Um, and so conversely, there's this, again, a conversation about O2, um, non-peak orgasm sex, and, and how that can be for a man as well as a woman. And... Um, that's something that, that my partner Chloe and I practice and we've talked about on the show, um, before. So I'm, I'm intrigued. I mean, I, I guess I, I feel a little good. Like, oh, I'm doing an advanced practice. I didn't even know. Um, <laughs> but, but on the other hand, I do know because one thing is it's really hard to not just to not get on that train. Like once the train leaves the station, um, and, uh, and also it's, um, it's not a, a way of having sex that people are particularly accustomed to. Um, so I guess that branches into how you have sex and have it not be orgasm driven. But I want to, I want to keep to the topic of orgasmic meditation. And, um, and I love this, I, this, um, idea about, um, letting the strokey, no, the stroker experience that empathetic, um, orgasm and and I'm sure that that's a question that gets asked a lot like what's in it for the, sh the person doing the stroking mm, yeah totally that, that does get asked frequently um, funnily enough uh, the most frequent person to ask that question in, a, in like your average intro to OM class is a woman which I always think is so telling in a certain way you know because I think women come to the practice and they're like they just don't believe they're just like, you mean someone might stroke me for 15 minutes and I don't owe them anything in return and they like it. And that's all And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's just hard for, for some people to, to believe it at first, you know, like uh, the first couple of years I was oming, I was just like waiting for the other shoe to drop in a certain way. Um, and then I, a few years into my practice, I actually tried stroking eventually. Like I always recommend that, um, that, um, women don't try stroking until they're full, like really full, like unquestionably filled to the brim 
with orgasm by their own definition. Um, and, 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 and where they just feel like every cell is just turned on and they're just like totally full and they not, not a single ounce of stroking would be done from obligation, but would be like a hundred percent from desire. That's always my recommendation, like as a coach and a teacher and everything. Um, and it's like, you know, people, people do how they want. Some people, you know, are like women are in relationships together and then they get to design their practice however they want to do it. And it also is still amazing. And it's just, it's an amazing thing for, for a woman to get to fill up in that way too. And so a few years in, I tried, um, stroking and, um, so I know for sure, you know, I, so when people ask that question, I get to answer from a stroker position also. And it's like, um, I've, I've had ohms as a stroker where I for sure probably felt more sensation than the strokey even because maybe she was newer to the practice and like her receptivity channels in a certain way weren't weren't as open as mine. Um, and so I could just feel more and stay present for more of the experience. And it's like this, it's really the same. It's really quite similar. You feel sensation, you feel electricity through your whole body, your finger sometimes gets, has so much sensation in it. It feels like almost this buzzing numbness, your stroking finger. You can feel like sometimes you'll feel a, um, like an electric spark at the tip of your finger that'll just travel up through your hand and up through your arm and like go to different places in your body. Um, sometimes your genitals feel turned on, you know, sometimes not, um, sometimes you feel like, like the bottoms of my feet have gotten really hot um, you pretty much, both people tend to feel the same after an ohm, you know, like you feel, um, grounded, uh, your mind is really quiet and you just feel vaguely happy. <laughs> um, and you just feel like, Oh, the rest of my day is going to be great. You know, like it just sort of, it's like doing a meditation in a way you f sort of flush out and, and alchemize a lot of the random, you know, energy and stuff in your body and just feel refreshed afterwards. Um, although it can also bring up, you know, emotional, you know, pockets and things like that too. Sometimes you feel, you know, like sadness will come up or anger or whatever. So all these different things. So same for stroker and strokey, same flush of oxytocin, all of that. Yeah. Awesome. And that's, that was, that's the flip side of what I was talking about earlier that the, the O2 land is meant to foster oxytocin, that pair bonding, um, molecule that courses through our, our system. Um, I'm curious. Oh, actually, the other thing that like struck me was how, um, one of the problems with, O2 sex is that question of like, when do you stop? Like if, you, if no one's having peak orgasms, then how do you know when it's over? Mm. And, um, and I like that about oming that practice that if it's limited to 15 minutes. And so, you know, when it's done, um, I mean, do people ever sneak in an extra five minutes or that's like, <laughs> uh, for sure. I've heard of that happening. And I, <laughs> I mean, we like way recommend against it. Um, you know, we're, we're huge, like all the staff, huge proponents of holding the container in like a serious sacred way, because, um, it's your, it's your practice space. You know, it's like, it's the, it, the time and the timing and all of that, you know, it's, it, it's the container that holds a very precious practice space that is separate from sex. It's separate from everything else in your life. It's a 15 minute place where you get to go and you want to maintain it and keep it immaculate. And so if you go over time or you, you know, there's different ways that people break the container sometimes. And it's like, it does have an impact. It has an impact on your practice. And it also, if it's a continuous thing, it has diminishing returns over time. And it can also like, foster distrust in a partnership or between two own partners over time as well and create um like uh weird expectations between them and then it has one person not really want to own with the other one anymore because they feel like then it's going to come then they don't know if it's going to be 15 minutes or 20 and which is it going to be this time because we broke the container three times so now are we going back to normal like do we talk about it do we not you know it's like right it just can do a lot yeah there's so much power in making agreements and then keeping them and, uh, and just like the container of your relationship gives you so much freedom to explore your own vulnerability and courage and w what, what's possible with two people, 
um, I can see how this is like the micro container of this particular practice and, and why that would be so important. Totally. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I want to get into the how to, but before we do, I want to go back to the second question that I had a long time ago. Um, and it came up for me because you were talking about women feeling safe, um, safe mm-hmm. to be women. And because this is so close to the work that Chloe and I do around um, helping people who've been affected by some form of trauma experience deep intimacy, um, the question naturally arises of for women who, or I mean for anyone, but particularly for women who have been through some form of trauma, um, do you find that this practice or even talking about it can be really triggering? Maybe I should have had a trigger warning at the beginning of the episode. And if so, like, what are some ways to address that that would be helpful for people listening and thinking like, well, it sounds good in theory, but I can't, I'm not sure I can even go there. Um, I mean, I, number one, like with people, I, I just always really trust their desire and their, what level their desire is at. Like, you know, I, um, I was speaking with a woman in the community recently. She was doing her, I think like third class with us. She had done the intro class and a couple of the intermediate classes and she still hadn't had her first ohm. And, um, and that to me is like great you know, like I trusted her process so deeply. I was just like, do not even worry about it. Like you can take classes with us. You can be part of the community. You can come to any events that you want to, you can belong here and you don't even have to do the practice until you're a hundred percent ready. Um, that's really, that's really how I, how I feel about it. Number one, you know, is just like, like everybody, we've no idea what people have been through. And so, um, it's so important to really listen to your own instincts and your own body, uh, around things like this. And, and then if there is a strong desire, uh, and it's confronting, but there's a big enough desire where you're, you're wanting to actually lean into the discomfort of it and move forward with it anyway, then I just suggest going slow and just continuing to listen to how, you know, it's like, um, maybe, maybe someone wants to do it, but they've had trauma in the past. And so that voice says, be cautious. And so they come around the community for a bit until they meet someone that they might want to try it with that resonates with them, that feels safe with to them. And then they ask that person. Um, and if they get asked by somebody before that, they're willing to give themselves the experience of saying, no, thank you. Mm. You know, like not, not, not like, creating it where they're, where they are saying yes to, you know, something they don't actually want to do. And, you know, it's like, we strongly encourage, like, be clear with your yeses and clear with your noes. It's always acceptable to say no. If somebody asks you to own, you can say no every single time if you want, you know, it's like you, you don't ever need to push yourself past where you're comfortable going. And, um, and then that being said, some people come in and they want, they want to really push past their comfort zone. Uh, Cause that's where they're coming from. And that's great too. You know, there's lots of ways to, to do that as well. You know, like lots of, you, you could own with, um, you know, if, if like it feels edgy to own with a lot of people, you could own with a lot of people. If that feels like an edge you want to play with, you know, it's like people really get to come in and do it how they want to. Um, and it, it is, I, I mean, by nature, it's confronting. And I think it's kind of meant to be somewhat confronting. I think um, it's like we don't, we don't have to add anything to it for it to be confronting. Um, but it just is. And I think uh, the level of vulnerability that really for both people, stroker and stroky, I think being a stroker is also incredibly vulnerable. Um, with that level of vulnerability, uh, it's just going to, it's just going to come with a lot of different feelings. It's going to bring up a lot of different stuff. It's meant to bring up a lot of different stuff. It's meant to really, what happens is it kind of floods the basement of your being and your psyche with a lot of, um, motion and electricity and orgasmic energy. And so all the stuff that you tend to kind of put in the basement of your identity Um, parts of yourself that, you know, you have shame around or like past traumas or um, relationships that you never released, you know, things like that, all that stuff gets stirred up. 
and comes percolating up into your practice. And that's similar to any practice, you know, really literally any practice, but yoga is a great example. I've had pigeon poses where I suddenly was bawling and have no idea why. I'm like, what is happening? It's no joke when they say that, that you store a lot of emotion in your hips. Wow. Um, <laughs> so if you store a lot of emotion in your hips, you can imagine how much emotion you store in your in your genitals or just in your body in general as a stroker stuff comes up too. I had a, um, I had a stroker once years ago and we would own every day um, for a couple months and every day he would say, well, I've been crying in all of my ohms lately. Um, so I'm just going to let you know. And I'd be like, okay, cool. And then we would ohm and he would cry through the whole entire ohm cry. And we just ohm for the 15 minutes and then, you know, close up the container. And it was just the most beautiful experience really. Like I, I, it touched my heart so deeply and the, you know, the, the sensation of it was, really different than any other ohm I'd ever had. His heart was just so cracked open and it was beautiful, you know, so stuff comes up for sure. Along those lines with um, some compassion for the vulnerability of the stroker, what could you suggest for potential strokers listening to this conversation who want to introduce the possibility to their partner in a way that is inviting? Um, well, I think the, fir the first thing that came to mind was um, don't be surprised or take it personally if she's, if she's confronted or like weirded out um, because it's a lot to have. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, like I haven't so much experienced this, but I've talked to people in the community who it, it was the it was a man woman relationship and it was him who came across the practice first and introduced it to her. And she, you know, rejected it and got mad at him for it because, but then later realized that it was something she really wanted. And then they, they both began to own, you know, they, they began an oming practice with each other. But, um, I think it can be, you want to do what to my what? You know, it's like very, <laughs> it's a lot to have at first. It can be, it can take a little while to open up your mind to it. So I think coming with, you know, resources is great, oh, to be honest, like coming with the website and maybe like a couple specific Nicole Dayton videos from YouTube where she talks about really cool stuff. Um, and like maybe a blog from the website and whatever, just coming with different, you know, the how to own video coming with the different pieces can be really helpful too. And you could be like, listen, I have this idea, check it out and just like, let me know what you think. And then maybe even leave her with the resources and then check back in the next day or something. You know, like <laughs> That kind of thing can be helpful. Actually, no matter who you are and whether what, whatever gender you're introducing it to, it's, it can be good that way too. Yeah. Maybe with a, a little chocolate mint and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> totally. Here you go, babe. <laughs> Check this thing out. Let me know. Here's a mint. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's, let's get started. Um, and would you be so kind as to let us know, how do you do it? What do you like? What are the basic steps that are involved for, people who want to try oming. Sure. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll definitely like, I'll take you through an abridged quick version of the steps to having an ohm. And, um, for sure, like for anybody listening, like, you know, look up the how to ohm video on YouTube and go to our website and check out, you know, there's a, there's like a free online ohm class on the website called ohm 101. And there's like a stroking app, you know, called the Ohm guide and everything. And so there's so many resources. So don't, don't try to do it just from my words today because, <laughs> because <laughs> they're, <laughs> it would be a little challenging, but, um, steps to an Ohm. So step one is, uh, asking for an Ohm. Either person can ask for an Ohm. Uh, you can, you know, always say yes. You can always say no. You can give an explanation or not. If you say no, you don't have to give an explanation. You can, um, you can, so you can have the ohm right then, or you could set up a date and a time for the ohm. Um, you know, just like with any agreement, you know, for like some kind of commitment commitment around like a meeting or a time, it's like you want to honor that or or be courteous about changing it. You know, there's a certain uh, we call it tumescence, um, which in the dictionary basically literally means swollen. 
I mean, you don't really hear the word tumescence except in romance novels describing like a member, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the way we use it is um, tumescence is kind of like unpotentiated energy in the body, and it can it can feel irritating at times. Um, and so when you ask for an omen and you set it up, let's say for next Tuesday. Uh, there's a certain level of tumescence that gets created between the two people. It's like there's a connection made and there's a thing that's going to happen in a week and you can feel the tumescence between you and it it's it can actually be pleasurable and kind of nice and then you ohm and it's like, whoo, and it alchemizes that, that feeling. Um, or it's like if someone flakes or, you know, like cancels last minute or whatever, then it's like that tumescence rises to an irritating point. And so it's just something to be considerate and conscious of. Mm. Um, so asking for an ohm and then let's say you're going to ohm right then. So then after that, you would set up the nest. Uh, nest is basically a yoga mat. Uh, if it's a hard floor, don't need a yoga mat if it's carpet. Um, a blanket, three pillows and a zafu or meditation cushion or something something super firm like that to sit on or like a couple of fairly firm pillows something that's not going to slip that you can sit on that that feels like it gives you some height and it's firm um and then you uh, get into position she would lay down first you have some items that you would need a uh, timer most people use a, a timer app on their cell phone um a small washcloth type of towel, which will go underneath her butt in case uh, lube drips down. Um, and then also at the very end of the ohm, there's a towel stroke. Uh, and I'll go over that in a couple minutes. Um, so oh, what's the other thing? Oh, lube. So we have like a special lube that we recommend that we make um, at One Taste called One Stroke. And it's like olive oil, beeswax, shea butter, and grapeseed oil. And it's all natural. And it's it has a certain viscosity where you don't have to go back for more. Like you shouldn't have to go back for more. Mm. Great for oming, not great for anything. Oh, no. Well, any kind of stroking is great for. Sex, not great for. Um, and so you have your lube, towel, timer. Oh, and gloves. We use gloves. Um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a separate thing from sex. Um, if you're in a relationship with somebody and you don't want to use gloves, we do not police people and gloves uh, <laughs> at all. And we highly recommend that, that you use gloves. It's a nice element of the container. Um, you know, even with like, you know, like intimate partners and stuff, like I always use gloves. It's just a standard normal thing in the practice. Um, I recommend vinyl over latex personally. Uh, so you have your gloves ready. And so she gets into position um, butterflies ju just undresses from the waist down. Everything else stays on. Uh, everything on the stroker stays on. She butterflies her legs open. He will step into position. This is where you need the video, you know, really, because it's kind of hard to describe, yeah. uh, you know, just with words. But he'll step into position um, and then sit down on the Zafu, which is to her right. And then her right leg goes over his right leg. His left leg is over her belly. And then um, the first thing he does is what's called safe porting. Mm. And so he will say what he's going to do before he does it. So he says, I'm going to, I'm going to touch your thighs now. And it's said just like that. So it's like, it's more of a statement and uh, it's firm, but he does look to her quickly for confirmation and consent. So it's not a statement without looking for consent. Like he actually, you're actually looking for that moment of like a nod or a yes. And you're saying it with confidence in a statement form because it's grounding. Like it actually just feels better than being like, can I touch your thighs? <laughs> it's just when you're in that position, it actually feels more, more grounding and better to be stated that way. Um, and so he'll say, I'm going to touch your thighs now. She says, yes. He puts one hand on each thigh and presses uh, with like medium pressure to the floor. This is for grounding purposes. It's for the rhythms of each of their bodies to begin to sync up. Um, so he'll do that for maybe 30 seconds, 45 seconds or so. Um, and then holding his hands uh, still on her thighs, just, just in that same grounding position, he'll do what's called the noticing step. That's what's next is the noticing step. And that's when, um, 
fact, the stroker will put full visual attention on the strokey's genitals and then describe out loud at a volume level that she can hear, uh, like two or three value neutral noticings, visual noticings. Um, and so correct way to do noticing step would be something like I see, um, dark curling pubic hair that comes down in a triangular shape over your clitoral hood, which is a peach color. And then she would just say, thank you. Um, Incorrect, common, commonly, commonly done and incorrect ways <laughs> of doing the noticing step would be, um, uh, I'll exaggerate it just a little bit. Uh, your yoni is so soft and beautiful. <laughs> 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 so not value, not, that's not value neutral. Right. Um, and so it's just like, it, it, it can be like learning a new language a little bit, uh, to, to do noticing and start to name sensations later on there's frames and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, it can be like almost learning a whole new language. So it's a common, common mistake. Um, so noticing step and then I'm uh, sorry, I have to like picture it all in my head and, uh, noticing okay and so then he said she'll say thank you just to acknowledge the uh, communication cycle it's not so much like thank you for noticing my genitals it's just like to close the communication cycle <laughs> um and then uh maintaining contact with her body like uh, like an elbow lightly touching her thigh then the stroker will put the gloves on and um and it's just like, it's just like maintaining connection in a certain way. The elbow is just like maintaining connection in, in a way. Mm. And then uh, putting the gloves on and then another safe port. You get the lube ready and then you do another safe port and you say, I'm going to touch your genitals now. Again, glancing to her or listening for a yes or glancing for a nod. Again, the consent. Um, and then you do the lube stroke. Um, so it's like a... It starts, it's the left forefinger and uh, you'll have like a dime sized amount of lube on there. And then you will do a stroke that begins um, just on that very outside of her introitus, which is the entrance to the vaginal canal um, and comes up between her inner labia. It's a, it's a fairly light, slow, although not like painfully slow stroke upward and we do it that way because it's easier to find and land on the clit um, if you start from below and you come up between the inner labia. Sometimes, depending on anatomy, it can be challenging to find and land on the, the clit. And so if you do it that way, it can help a lot. Um, and so you kind of make your way up and then find and land on the clit and then hold your finger there. And then you're going to put your right thumb We'll have a little bit of lube on it also. And that right thumb will rest on the outside of her introitus. It doesn't go in. It just rests on the outside. Um, and again, you can see all this stuff on the, you can't, there's not like a actual vagina on the video, but you can pretty much see all of this on the video. <laughs> there's drawings. <laughs> Great. And um, we'll, we'll definitely have links in the okay. show notes for, uh, for this episode so that everyone can find their way right there. Oh, and, perfect. Uh, okay, yeah, cool. and I'll just take a moment to um, interrupt and say that if you are interested in the show guide for this episode, which is going to have the detailed description as well as the relevant links, you can visit neilsatin.com slash ohm, and that's just O-M, uh, or you can text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions and we'll send you a link so that you can download the show guide. So that way, everyone who's listening, if you're driving in your car, you don't have to try and picture this all right now. Um, you can just text us at the next stop sign and we'll make sure you get the detailed show notes um, in your email. Okay, um, great. So we were at um, one the the left forefinger finding its way up to the clit the right thumb at the introitus um just resting there take it away aubrey <laughs> yeah that's right um okay so 
So it's so funny, like all this information and we haven't even started to stroke yet, you know, <laughs> it's so specific. It really is. But it's, it's just like as, as a little side note, um, if you have all these things in place and you really follow the container in this way, the vigilance center in both people just rests completely and you can actually go into the experience. Like you can let go of your day, you can let go of your mind, you can let go of, you know, all the different potential things that could, you know, like all the stuff that could hijack your mind and just go into the experience fully. And so each of these things is really meant to help handle that vigilance center. Um, so yeah, so then the thumb on the outside of the chair. Okay. So then from there, and you've, I forgot to mention, like you, you would start the timer right before you would, um, go to actually touch the genitals. That's when you start the timer for 15 minutes. So everything before that is like a pre- you know, a pre thing. So really like from setting up nest to closing up nest in ohm experience, if you do it efficiently and at the speed that it's like meant to be done, it's about 22 minutes. Uh, and the, the stroking itself is 15 minutes. Got it. So just, just to be clear. Um, so then from there you would begin the actual stroke. And when you're first starting out, um, you're not really trying to, you know, you're just feeling your way through the experience. You're not, you're not trying to do any kind of like techniques or anything. It's an up down stroke. Um, you want to start with what we call a basic bread and butter stroke, which is up down, up down, up down. It's typically a lot shorter and a lot lighter than what people have experienced in sex or, you know, in sexual situations uh, or what they're expecting, both men and women all genders. It's a lot, it's a lot lighter and a lot shorter than what you're probably thinking. Um, you wouldn't stroke any firmer than you would stroke an eyelid. Um, I'm trying that right now on my, yeah. <laughs> on my eyelid. Yeah. Um, uh, can you talk about the one o'clock position too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, there's different spots on a clitoris. Obviously it's a very small area already. Um, but there's different spots. There's a whole clock um, the founder talks, Nicole Dadon talks a lot about, um, in some of our more advanced classes and stuff, she'll talk about the clock face of the clit. So the top would be 12 o'clock. Like if you're looking directly at a clit across from it, you know, in front of, if you're in front of one, the top is 12 o'clock. And then so to the woman's slight left, her slight left is the one o'clock spot. And, um, I personally, in, in my mind, I kind of think of the one o'clock spot as home. It's like... It's, it tends to be where the most sensation is. It's where, for whatever reason, you're going to end up spending most of your time when you're stroking. Uh, as a strokey, it's where you end up directing strokers back to quite a bit. It's not the only place that's ever going to be stroked on your clit. And for whatever reason, there are an, a particularly enormous amount of nerve endings in that location, more so than on any other part of the clit. Um it's like a whole bundle just in that one spot. And so it's, it's all, it's almost always very electric and uh, magnetic in a certain way. And a lot of times people compare it to like when they find the one o'clock spot, it, it stroker and strokey, it feels like uh, when you lick a battery, I didn't lick a battery when I was a kid, but apparently <laughs> this is a thing, but it like zaps, you know, like there's like a zap feeling. Mm. Um, so that's what they, that's what it, it, that's what it feels like when you touch that spot. Cool. Yeah. And I, I think Nicole also describes it as like, you kind of lock in, like there's, mm. it just feels right when you're, when you're there. Totally. Yeah. You just, it's a great, it's not, you can't, it's not a formula. So it's not a hundred percent of the time go going to, um, like work the same way. And probably 90% of the time it's, it's where you can find resonance with the person. Mm. And then what happens? So the, the stroker is stroking mm -hmm. in light up down strokes. Mm -hmm, yeah. And it, you know, your stroke evolves quite a bit over the years, you know, like, um, the subtlety of adjustments begins to open up over, over time with a lot of practice, you know, like eventually, um, you have a, you have a butterfly stroke and you have like a med a meaty, heavy stroke and you have a, um, 
uh, strokes that have that are more on different parts of the pad of your finger and strokes that are more very much at the tip of the finger and um, the strokies get incredibly nuanced in how they can direct you know they, they go just a tiny 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 bit to the left and a little bit lighter and it's it's sometimes the as a stroker I have had moments where um, she would say go a little to the left and I would just think left. I wouldn't even move anything. You know, it's such a subtle adjustment. Sometimes you barely move because it's such a small area, but it changes everything. Every little tiny nuance of adjustment changes everything. Location, speed, pressure, um, all of those, like mo- uh, um, adjusting any of those changes the whole sensory experience. Where does each person... Two questions. Where does each person place their attention? And um, and maybe you could talk for a minute about that, like how the feedback ideally occurs between stroker and strokey. That's such, that's such a great question. I don't think anyone has ever asked me that question in a conversation like this about <laughs> Ohm. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, you place your attention at the point of contact. Um, the point of contact between finger and clit is just like in, in sitting meditation where, where it's, they always say, like, bring your attention back to the breath. In OM, it's bring your attention back to the point of contact. If you lose your way, if you get in your head, if you, you know, your mind wanders or whatever, uh, you always bring your attention back to the point of contact. Um, and you do, you just breathe naturally. Sometimes people ask about breath, so I might as well just say that. You just breathe naturally. You don't try to do anything in particular with your breath. Got it. And so they're not like gazing into each other's eyes or anything like that. Actually, specifically not. And it's, it's, um, it's not because we don't like intimacy. We love intimacy. Um, (laughs) it's already really intimate. It's like, um, I would, I would say for both stroker and strokey, but maybe particularly for the strokies, it really, I'll just even speak for myself. Like that, feels like um if i had to do that in an ohm i would feel on the hook for um having to show up a certain way in the ohm Mm -hmm. and maybe even get off in a certain way and um like there's an expectation or i might even just invent expectation and project it you know but it's like if i get to relax close my eyes and go into my own experience in connection with a person, but like really go into my own body and my own experience. I, I, I can let go a lot more. Like if I'm having to maintain eye contact, I'm going to be thinking about the other person's experience far, far more than I need to be. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Great. So that is what not to do with your eyes. Um, (laughs) And if you could chat for a moment about feedback as you work through work, that's the wrong word maybe, but (laughs) as you stroke through um, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Feedback, yeah. Yeah, feedback. Sure. Um, uh, There's a a pretty large amount of communication in Oming. Maybe not always. It depends. You know, I've had ohms where there wasn't an adjustment or an offer made the entire time, and that's more rare. Like usually, there's adjustments and offers throughout the ohm. Um, it's not a formula, so there's not. It's not like every thirty seconds or two minutes or whatever you make an adjustment. You know, it's just as it comes, as you desire. Um, strokers make offers, um, such as, "Would you like me to go a little to the left, or would you like me to use a a little more pressure, something like that." Um, would you like me to pull your hood back a little more? That's a good one. Um, strokies will make adjustments. Uh, so something like, can you uh, move your finger up a tiny bit? Or uh, can you go a little right? Um, and then uh, you might end up... there. So there could be a lot of communication throughout the entire ohm. There could be a lot of speaking. The only thing to be cautious of is like to keep the... Offers and adjustments, really simple. Yes or no answers. If uh, the person says no, um, you know, if it's just, just if you make an offer and the strokey says no, then you just keep doing what you're doing and it's great. If she says yes, then you make the adjustment and it's great, you know. Um, either way, it's win-win. Uh, so you want to keep it really simple like that so that people don't have to go into their head. Mm. You know, like you get to stay in your body. So that's kind of the, the point of the simple communication. Yeah, and a question that comes up for me is 
the as the strokey would i um like what am i trying to do and i know the idea is that you're not trying to do anything but i could imagine someone being stroked being like well i want you to do this and speed up and like oh my god here we go um you know oh one peak orgasm happening mm. um so is that do you want to not do that or it doesn't matter or what's the no it's actually yeah that's a great question um so let's see it's a it's interesting because ultimately it's a goalless practice um and so you're you're neither uh, pursuing nor avoiding climax for instance um so if you climax totally fine awesome you know not the point of ohm but also not not the point like you can climax that's great if you don't climax great um and so it's just taking the pressure off is really a lot of it. Um, it's just like, it's like letting both people just sink into a feeling state without having any kind of an agenda. Um, and so, and, and getting to just, just feel human connection in a really vulnerable way without anything extra on top of it whatsoever is kind of the point of it. Uh, and just feeling for it and being present to whatever transpires on a sensory level in that space. Um, and then, but then sometimes people do actually have goals within a goalless practice, which is also great and normal, you know, like, um, perhaps someone wants to, maybe a strokey comes in and she feels like, a, let's say, um, first of all, I think, I, I think I'm not saying anything bad about vibrators. I think vibrators are great. I have known women who have, who have massively overused vibrators in lieu of connection in a way where they they felt like they overdid it and lost sensitivity. Um, and so oming resensitizes, um, the clitoris and the vagina. So, uh, some women, you know, for instance, will come in with a goal of resensitizing, um, as an example of a goal, which is great. And so then maybe, um, maybe as part of that goal, she might actually ask for very light strokes um, instead of heavy strokes, because a vibrator would be like akin to heavy strokes. And so light strokes is going to be the thing that kind of draws, like draws her, her sensation and her desire and that part of her that yearns and like reaches to have that next stroke, um, brings that part back out. And so you, you might have goals within the goalless practice. And so, um, so that, that also might be what it's about for you that day or that week or that month or whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes total sense. Cool. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time together and it's been an hour, but we haven't even finished 15 minutes yet. So <laughs> <laughs> let's, um, I guess, skip ahead a little bit and I want to make sure that we get the, the final essential steps for our listeners. Sure. Yeah, I can, I can kind of go through the last ones because for sure, like if anyone's hanging on my every word at this point, they're probably going to look up the video anyway. So that's good. Um, <laughs> so let's see, we're at stroking. Um, there's a thing called peaking um, that you learn really with experience in ohm over time. It's not, you might not identify peak, natural peaks uh, in an ohm right away, um, but it's something you'll definitely notice over time with practice. Um, peaking. Okay. So then uh, the first timer will go, there's, a, there's actually two timers. There's a 13 minute one and a 15 minute one. And the 13 minute one will go off and the stroker will say out loud uh, so she can hear two minutes. And then for that last two minutes, um, he's primarily going to do downstrokes. Uh, downstrokes are more with the pad of the finger, a little bit more pressure, maybe a tiny bit longer, but still pretty much, you know, not, not that different from what you were doing before. Um, and uh, that's just for the purpose, like those last two minutes, it's just to ground the experience back down into the body. The ohm may have gone really high. It may have been really, you know, trippy or like out there or somebody might be like, I saw God, I had a rebirth experience. Wah! You know, like you never know. <laughs> and so you spend those last two minutes just grounding back down to earth, uh, back down to the body, um, you know, kind of landing. And then the last timer will go off and that one is 15 minutes. The stroker will say time. And then, um, stop stroking right at that 15 minutes, turn the timer off. He'll apply grounding pressure, uh, which is a specific kind of cups, the hands over the genitals of um, the strokey in a specific way and applies pressure. Um, and then we'll do the towel stroke also very specific. It goes over all this stuff in the video. 
and then leaves the towel, you know, folded in a nice way actually on her genitals so that she can do further cleanup if she wants to. And then we'll help her sit up. And then they will do what's called sharing frames, which is a snapshot of sensation from some point in the ohm. Uh, very simple. She may say something like, um, there was a moment around the middle of the ohm where I felt a, uh, a lot of heat bloom through my genitals all at once. And it was like a, a hot melting feeling. And then he would just say, thank you. And then he might say something like, there was a moment at the and some people are really, you know, if they've been practitioners for a long time, they're very specific. Some people might say, at 12 minutes, I felt um, a, a sharp blue bolt of electricity through my whole left hand, and it shot um, through my shoulders, you know, something like that. And then she would just say, thank you. And then they put away the nest, and then the container is officially closed after that. Great. And there was one thing that I was reminded of when you were describing the the final downstrokes, which was the description of like whether it's an upstroke or a downstroke, you you maintain contact the whole time, right? That's that's a really important thing to know. It's that is right. That's right. You maintain contact the whole time. So it's the emphasis is on the down in that case. Got it. So yeah. for those of you listening, it's not like you're picking up your finger and going up and then stroking down. It's like you, you're actually maintaining contact that entire time. And it's it reminds me of what you said about the intention of left, like rather than even really doing anything, it's like you have the intention of up and the intention mm -hmm. of down. And Yeah, that's, that's right on. That's exactly right. Yeah. Great. Well, Aubrey uh, Fuller, thank you so much for your detailed description of how to ohm. And I encourage everyone who's interested to, to explore further, to check out the video, the online course that they offer on onetaste.us, which is free. Um, and the, uh, and also the book Slow Sex by Nicole Day Doan is a great way to learn more about the practice, especially why you would do the practice. I mean, I found myself reading the book being like, why wouldn't someone do this? Like, I can't imagine reading it and being like, oh, that sounds okay. You know, like it's, um, yeah. So it's, um, really fascinating. And I think totally aligned with this idea of, rediscovering what is possible in the way that we connect with each other and particularly through that sexual and sensual energy. So Aubrey, thank you so much for the generosity of your time and your wisdom and your experience in coming on the show today to talk to us about orgasmic meditation. Yeah, you're so welcome. That was, that was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And I want to close with the quote that we talked about because we I asked Aubrey, why is One Taste called One Taste? And she said, it's some quote like Ken Wilber or the Buddha or something like that. So we Googled it and before we got on and, and here's the quote. Just as the great ocean has one taste, the taste of salt, so also this teaching and discipline has one taste, the taste of liberation. So my wish for all of you listening is that you may find some liberation in, um, in this practice and in general, um, liberation from how you're supposed to do things, um, and discover how you yourself want to do things in love and in relationship. Mm. Amen. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aubrey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word passion, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.